Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tuesdays for Teachers. Today we're going to talk about thinking strategies for crafting constructed responses, and we're doing going to do part one today. This is a two-parter. Today we're going to evaluate evidence to support a claim, and with me today are Daphne Atkinson, Susan Pittman, and I'm Bonnie Goonan. So let's get started, Susan. What we're going to talk about today is the importance of instructional routines, making thinking processes visible so we can help our students in becoming more effective writers. And we're going to talk about some of those thinking routines that are absolutely necessary in order to the steps in drafting a constructed response. And then, like always, we're going to share some resources and ideas to get you started. But before we do, Susan, let's get started by taking just a quick poll, okay? That sounds good. So what I'm going to do at this point is we're going to launch the first poll. And if you'll let uh, bear with me just a moment, and I will pull up the first question. And so we want to know where everyone is from. So our first question here is which region best describes where you're located? And our poll is open, and what we're hoping for is we can at least hit that 90% mark as we go through. That would be absolutely wonderful. It always helps us to know the regions that we're working with today and to see, you know, which regions are best represented. Mm, absolutely, and it looks to me like right at the moment, the Southeast is taking the lead. So come on, the rest of you better Go with it now so you can't just let one part take all of it. So, Bonnie, we have 80% who have voted at this particular point in time, so we're going to go for five seconds more. And at that point, we will close that poll and we'll share the results with everyone. And the poll is closed. We did make it, Bonnie, to 84%. Uh, and let's see what it says. And as you can see, yes, the Southeast won out this time, 31%, with the Midwest a little bit back from there. Uh, so we're so glad, though, to have everybody who could be here with us today. And it gives us a great idea of where everyone is as we go through and share information with you. But Bonnie, I think we want to know a little bit more. And I think what we want to know at this point is that we really want to take a look at what, do, what type of position do you hold um, and get a feel for that. So I'm going to launch the poll now. And it is open. So are you full-time instructors, part-time? We do know we had corrections that comes in as well. Or maybe you're not an instructor. Maybe you are a program manager or some other role that might possibly be there. So Bonnie, you know, you're a little faster I'll out there this time because now they're already up to 80%. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And this is one of those questions that's really important for Susan and me as we're looking at developing webinars to know who our audience is. So we thank you very much for letting us know, you know, which best describes your position. So Susan, five more seconds. Five seconds more. And well, we're at 84% again, so we will close the poll and share the results. Oh, thank you, thank you for those of you who are part-timers and corrections. We know sometimes it's more difficult for you to get on, but there again, great to see that 30% of you are full-time, and we love having program managers here because we strongly believe you are instructional leaders. And Susan, I would say the other, we probably have some volunteers and some tutors and, and maybe some counselors out there. Absolutely. So. So, now we need to know how many of you have been with us before. So this is a simple question. Did you attend the April Tuesday for Teachers webinar? So we will launch the poll. 
And just a quick yes or no. Bonnie, as I sit here, I'm looking at this poll in progress, and it's kind of like a race back and forth between yes and no. But we're up to 85, 86% now. That's great. In fact, everybody's getting much faster at this as we go through. So what we're going to do is we're going to close the poll at 86% having reported in and share the results. Oh my goodness, we have some folks who we're not with as a fairly large percent, but we're thrilled to see that 43% of you were. So this next question may be a little more difficult for those who were not with us to answer, but let's see. Okay, sounds good to me. So have you used those strategies and materials from April's Tuesday for Teachers? And maybe it's the fact that uh, you've accessed them from the GED Testing Service website. So let's see, and so you have three possibilities here. And we will launch the poll. Susan, we do want to make sure that these materials are useful, and so what we hope is that if you have not accessed the materials, and that of course is perfectly fine, that you do so, um, because those materials are archived for your use. And at this point, we're going to close the poll, and we will share those results with you. Oh, I'm thrilled. 32% of you have used something. Thank you, thank you. That's great to hear. And as Bonnie said, if you haven't used any or you don't know how to access those materials, then we'll talk a little bit more as we go through um, at the end of this uh, at the end of the session today and talk about what a great resource it is for the GED testing service for us to be able to go in and look for those materials. So Bonnie, I think we have at least one more question, maybe two. And so let's take a look at this next area. And it really is, as Bonnie mentioned a few minutes ago, we really want to plan so that things can that fit you and, and what your needs are in the programs around the country. So as you're thinking about, okay, looking at webinars maybe in the fall or whenever, uh, what would you like to see us focus on? What are some additional things? And so I'm going to launch the poll and We'd like to know in which of those areas you have the greatest needs, reasoning through language arts, social studies, science, mathematical reasoning. You know, Susan, one of the reasons that we're doing constructive response so strongly this session and next is that was one of the areas that folks kept saying, our students just are not doing well on this. They're still getting scorable zeros, and we want to make sure that they get some points, not just to get a better score on the RLA test, but because our students need those skills in real world. So let's see what this group decides today. Okay, well, it's actually, Bonnie, it's pretty much neck and neck here between reasoning through language arts and mathematical reasoning. So you can see from here 31% RLA versus 33%, and Bonnie looks like science is up very far behind either. You know, I have a feeling since we had just done a social studies one not long ago, Go. And since there is no longer a constructed response on social studies, that may be why we have a little lower percentage there. That could be. And we have one more question for you, and it comes back to something we've been talking about before. And it comes down to, have you accessed the webinar archive at the GED testing service? And a simple yes or no.
and with 82% of the vote in, that I'm going to close the poll and share those results. And just look, we actually have pretty much a split, 51% yes, 49% no. And so we will talk more about uh, the archive and where you can find that as you go on the GED Testing Service website. And we really, for those of you who are with us today, you may have colleagues back in uh, your programs that you want to share that information with. Um, so it's open to everyone to be able to go back in and find those archives. So keep that in mind as we go through. So we thank you for participating in all of these different polls that we have done today. And what we're going to do at this point is, Bonnie, I think there's a special event coming up. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? There sure is, and it is so new that you don't have it on your PowerPoint. But if you'll take a look at it, um, you will see that there is indeed something called a GD Grad Day virtual event, and it's coming up June 15th. And an email went out last week in the in-session educator list to all of those you have signed up for it with some details. However, knowing that, just to let you know, there's going to be a webinar this Wednesday, tomorrow, to talk more about not only this wonderful social, social media event to celebrate GED grads and their accomplishments, but also some marketing information for you. And our GEDTS folks will put that URL, URL into the chat box because it is very lengthy. So if it's something that you're interested in learning more about, stay tuned. Um, just another wonderful way to celebrate our fantastic GED grads and then to help motivate that next generation of students that we want to take you know, the test and get on with their lives. So just a quick update before we get going. So Susan. Okay. And Bonnie, before we go into the next slide, just a couple things that have come up um, just from some questions that are out there. One of them is that uh, some people are having difficulty clicking on the link for those PDFs. Um, so you should be able to just click on each one and open it. However, if it doesn't open for you, keep in mind that it will be in the archive so you can um, uh, pick up that material after the webinar itself is, is completed, you'll be able to do that as well. And we have one more thing, and that's one of us, Bonnie, you or me, we're cutting out a little bit when it comes to the sound. And so the question was that she said something about not being on the social studies test, and so um, you were talking just specifically when people weren't connecting that much with social studies as being one of the higher needs. Jennifer, I do believe that what the, the comment was is that since there's no longer the extended response on the social studies test and the fact that very recently we had a webinar that dealt with social studies, that's probably why not as many people um, actually have come in uh, in order to do this. So, and we do have one other thing from Sheila, and she has caught a um, an error on our on our part, and it's that uh, webinar on it is Bonnie. I believe the webinar is five twenty five. Is that correct? Oh yes, it is. My goodness, my good, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so Sheila, yeah. thank you for catching that for us because it would be hard for us to go back to 425 and have a new webinar. So thank you for letting us know that. As far as the next scheduled webinar for social studies, what you may want to do is go in and check the archives so that you can um, use the information that is included there. We don't have one planned right at this point, but again, we try to let everyone, uh, kind of uh, the different people who are with us, help drive that. So having said that, Bonnie, we're going to get started with our big topic for today, and it really is all about how we can teach thinking skills because our students really need to learn not just a bunch of facts, but how to think, 
how to take information. Um, as Albert Einstein said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. And that's really what we want to do with our students. But the reality is that for many of our students, we're not demonstrating for them really what that thinking process is and how we do it. So they need us to do some modeling. So Bonnie, can you talk a little bit about what is this thing called making thinking visible? Susan, we talked about this um, when we were dealing with math. So for those of you who were with us, you've heard some of this, but know that it's not just about math. It's also about making our thinking visible in the writing and reading process. And in the past, our traditional approach has often been where we just give that prescribed um, curriculum to our students, trying to get something into their heads, where what we really want to do is teach for understanding, trying to get what is in our students' heads into our own so that we can help them out and be responsive to what they're doing. This comes from a project from Harvard and it started in 1967. What they were trying to do and continue to try to do is to come up with routines that are going to be very useful to help our students learn how to think. So what we're going to talk about today are some beginning thinking goals for our students and there's many different types of thinking goals that we want our students to have. We want them to be able to problem solve and make connections. We want them to describe what's there and to notice and wonder. We definitely want them to reason with evidence which we see so much in the reading and writing process and when they have that evidence to form conclusions and to go that next step and look at something very complex as well as from different vantage or viewpoints. These goals are really an integral part of thinking routines that Harvard staff has come up with. So when we're looking at thinking routines, they're really tools for us as teachers because we want our students to form habits. Things that as they go from different types of, of reading and writing tasks, that they have habits of the mind built and that they can transfer those skills that we work so hard to teach from one type of area to the other. So what we're looking at are simple structures and tools that will advance our students' understanding and provide ways to make thinking visible, as well as patterns of behavior to help us use our own minds in new situations. As Susan said, oftentimes our students really think that we just enter a routine and we just do it. When we write something or read something, we just do it automatically that we don't ever have to struggle. In fact, we seldom spend enough time with our students showing them how we think through processes or how we use thinking routines. So as we talk today and at our next session, we're really going to reference some really what we consider good strategies or thinking routines. Routines that are going to be easy for you to remember and for your students to remember. We're going to name them so that we can talk about them as common practice because some of these are going to be used not only in RLA, so in some of the different areas as well. We want to make sure that our thinking routines are goal oriented so that they're for a specific purpose and they do work across those contexts and levels. And we want to make sure that we encourage our students to actively engage in what they're reading and what they're writing because it really is not just about facts any longer. So, as we look through visible thinking, there are a lot of benefits. And as Susan and I have been working with teachers, we found that those teachers who are incorporating some of that have not only aha moments for themselves as they look at how their students are addressing things, but they're learning very quickly that their students have a deeper understanding and that their classroom culture starts to change as not only are they teaching but their students are engaged and their students are thinking stronger and learning better. So if you're interested in looking more at the Harvard project, we've provided a few pages for you in your workbook, but we want to just set the stage that what we want are not struggling writers, but 
we want successful writers. And again, from a very well-known college, good old Vanderbilt, the Iris Center uh, from there has found that there are certain things writers do. If our students are struggling writers, well, I don't know about you, but to Susan and me, as we look at that column, we think of many of our students, because many of our students were those struggling writers. They just really were not quite aware of the purpose of writing, why should they do it, so their planning was less than excellent or even effective. They didn't seem to organize well. You know, it was what we often call free writing. They just kind of went through and wrote down, and it just went on and on. And let's face it, it just wasn't very focused or clear. And when you said, did you edit and revise, it was almost like, do what? Uh, no, teacher, you can do the edit and revision, and then I'll just make the corrections. And when Susan and I looked at this information from the IRIS Center, we really did see where many of our students were, but we also, as we looked at that successful writer, we saw where we wanted our students to be. And that first one we're going to talk about today, analyzing the task, because we do find our students are not good at analyzing or evaluating. And for them to improve their skills there, we need to show them how we analyze, how we evaluate, because by doing that, they will be better planners, better organizers, their writing will be more effective, and they will definitely do their own editing and revision. So, Susan, what do you think of that? Does that look like some of your students used to be the struggler or the successful? Well, absolutely. In, in fact, you know, there's another thing that I kind of was thinking about here with this particular slide, and that's that if I took this slide as, you know, just for myself in the classroom, I could be watching for some very specific things. And now I can have a plan for how to move them out of the struggling side and into the successful side. The one thing that I think, though, that I would have to make sure that I do is writing is a pretty big process in and of itself. So I really need to break it down into pieces. So I'm not trying to overwhelm my students as I'm going through. I want to take them just like I would do, and I want to break it down into smaller a group of smaller tasks. So that by the time we've finished, after maybe a couple different sessions, and I'm not saying that, you know, I would use my entire session to do something, but a portion of it that students could see the entire piece. And so I think that's a big part of it, is helping our students understand that that thinking process, that the active processing that they do, and putting that into some real short, easy to handle areas is going to make a big difference for our students as we go through. So you know, if you're going to do this in the classroom, you really do have to look at it as a teacher at, okay, there are certain routines that I identify and I'm going to put them into play within the classroom itself. I have to break down my instruction. So just as looking on that other slide, I had to, I'm going to focus on that planning part first and then I'll build different components. I think the biggest thing for me as a teacher is the modeling aspect of it. Is that, you know, do I really go into the depth of the thinking behind why I answer a question the way I do? And so those are the kinds of things that I have to move through and work with if I'm going to do this effectively for my students. And I like that word in that fourth bullet, purposeful, that there's a real purpose for those questions that are back to me and what I have to do because our students just don't have the model um, that they need in order to do this. So Bonnie, I think what we need to do is that we've got to look at the end first because if we 
are going to move that struggling writer over to that successful writer, then we need to know what that successful writer can do. And so how about we take and we go through this process a little bit with what we call effective on-demand draft writing. And Bonnie, what does that say for you when you hear on-demand draft? Oh, wow. It means that I'm not necessarily going to do my best work because I have this really short time frame that somebody's saying you need to do it now. And when I see the word draft, it means it's probably not the, quote, perfect product that I would like to do. Um, you know, I have a perfect example of that. I put in that one slide on demand <laughs> right before we started. It was a draft. And guess what? I didn't edit and revise it. That's on demand draft writing. OK. And see, you did that on purpose. And we didn't even know that you were going to do that. So <laughs> let's take a look, Bonnie, at beginning with the end in mind. And hopefully, for all of you who are with us today, you've had a chance to look at some of the new materials that the GD Testing Service has, has uh, placed out there with different types of prompts and responses. But we're going to take one of those responses and take a look at it from a standpoint of, is I'm in the classroom and I need to understand what this is, there's some questions I need to ask. So, Bonnie, if I'm looking at this, do I read just cold read the response or do I need to hook over here to the prompt first? You know, we don't want our students reading the source text until they've analyzed what they're supposed to do with those source text. And so I would want to model for my students how I'm going to, first of all, read that prompt very closely and analyze what it says to me because, gosh, what's that first word? Analyze. So, okay. this is, so what's it going to tell me to do? Okay, so it says I have to analyze an argument. So I'm going to, I, it tells me here, I've got two things that I'm going to read, a press release and a letter. Okay. okay. Now, it says in my response, I've got to develop, and it says I've got to develop an argument. So, and I have to understand what that argument's supposed to be about because I can argue about anything, Bonnie. But in this case, for this writing, I've got to go through and it says, okay, in which you explain how one position is better supported than the other. So, that tells me I should be looking for an argument somewhere and it's going to state the case. It's going to say, oh, this is better supported. But then it's got that other word. It's got incorporate evidence. And it's got to be not from my head and not the stuff that I know, but I have to put something from, ooh, I see that word, Bonnie, both, both sources to support my argument. So, okay, then having said that, Let's take a look and see if this particular one does that. And so let me go. And you know what you're supposed to be doing. So Bonnie, do a little quick look through on this one. I know you don't have time to read the entire thing right now, but do you okay. see any place where they've analyzed anything? Well, let's take a closer look. First of all, this particular student was writing and setting a claim based upon two source texts. Um, one of the source texts was a press release, the other was a letter to the editor, and one took the pro side that a road should be built, and the other took the con side the road shouldn't be built. So when I read this sample writing, I see that this particular writer has analyzed and evaluated because this person says the press release and the letter offer positions that are supported by 
both fact and opinion. But I also say that this test taker provides the claim in the first paragraph. Now we know we need a claim there and that writer says while both sides make an acceptable case, the letter provides a better supported argument. So I know that this writer is giving me a strong claim, even gives me at the end of that first paragraph, revisits that claim saying, although both parties may very well have the best interest of the district in mind and either position could be correct, it's clear that the letter provides a better supported argument. So this writer did a really good job in developing a claim. But we also need evidence, and it was supposed to be evidence from both sources and relevant. So if it's a better supported argument, then I should see that type of evidence. And boy, there's lots of evidence here. It's talking about a residence is more credible to a representative. There's factual information. It's backed by logical explanations. There is a lot of evidence. But this person also tells me why the evidence is good. And Susan, since you said this earlier, for every claim, there can be a counterclaim. For one side, there is definitely the other side. And this writer also tells me that the other side is good as well. It offers some facts. However, it rebuts that by saying, however, it's mainly specked with anticipation and hopes. Wow, I wish my students would write claims provide evidence and connections and counterclaims like this. This is pretty good, don't you think? Well, I would say that this is right up there at the top. I mean, okay. all the different pieces that we know from the rubric says that this student has really done a top-level job. And, you know, that's we would love to have all of our students be able to do that and hit that top level that, you know, over 175 on this and, and get that level two score and, and be what we know is college and, and career ready. But the reality is that not all our students can go to this level at this point in time. I think all of them have the capacity to do that later on, but we've got to start a little bit easier. So I may not be able to make it all the way up to that top, but I want to know that these are the elements that are there that I can get my students to at least a level one. So, but there's more, Bonnie, than just having claims and evidence in all this. I mean, That's true. the bottom line is that we still have a trait two, and trait two says, you know, I've got to look at the organization and the structure and, you know, I mean, there are a lot of words on the page. But if there's not a nice flow to that and I can't really understand what that student's doing, then that's a problem. So this one, yeah, you know, you can look at trait two and as you go through, the student's given a good organizational structure. I mean, there's great text divisions that are going in there. It makes sense as you move through. Um, as I'm reading through it, it does have that logical progression of ideas, which is something that we really want. And mm, I don't see any I think I feel I want in here. So this one is in that more formal third person style, and it's also got an appropriate tone. One other thing, this student really did develop ideas. And so I need to know, yes, there's transitional devices. You can see where the student analyzed different points. All of those things are there. So again, that's really good. But Bonnie, there's one thing that everybody always looks for, and that is, well, how about the grammar? And so let's take a look from this standpoint. And what do you think about the grammar here? You said it was on-demand draft writing, so do you expect it's going to be perfect? No, and I already see that the word restaurants is misspelled, but you know what? I know what it is. It really doesn't interfere with my understanding. So what I look at is the fact that this writing sample has largely correct and 
varied sentence structure. It's not all simple sentences. And although it's not perfect and it is on-demand draft writing, I also read this and notices, noticed that the writer also uses good punctuation and appears to follow those standards rules of English language. And just like you were saying earlier, good transitional words, clear and easy to understand, and limited errors. Now I noticed that, yeah, there's some run-on sentences and that word restaurant is misspelled, but those really are limited in English conventions. So it's not unusual that as we read through this, beginning with the end in mind, that this really is an example of a two, two, and two paper, a top level paper. But as we talked before, many of our students may not write at this level. However, they need to be able to model after effective writing. So we don't want to start them out with a scorable zero paper, but we want them to see something that they can model after. And this sure is a good example of an effective model. So, okay, Bonnie, so I tell you what. Let's put this, okay, we've looked at the top end, and we've seen through this, you know, what we can strive for. Now, will a lot of our students reach this point? No. But we really need to understand these pieces if we're going to figure out how we put the writing together. So let's move right on in, because I know we've got to watch our time as we go through. And let's put that making thinking process visible into action. Let's actually talk about some routines that we can do in order to do this. And I think, Bonnie, what you and I need to do is we really need to focus in on that whole thing of the importance of modeling. So let's make sure that we're doing that particular thing as we're going through. So as we look at this, Let's think in mind, and for all of you who are out there, you've got to look at making sure students really understand what you are describing, what you're looking for, and what they will be doing. Because I think for many of our students, we have this ongoing concern that students can't respond to some of these prompts, um, that they're having difficulty understanding what the prompt says, so, Bonnie, is there a way that we can go through and work with this prompt? There definitely is, and it does come back to modeling where we read the prompt, we ask questions of the prompt, and we interpret or unpack the prompt. It really is all about analyzing. So, as a class, we'd want to read the prompt, identify the verbs of what the prompt is asking us to do. But there's more to it. We also want students to truly understand what those words mean. So, we know that that prompt we were talking about earlier, the first thing it said was, analyze the arguments. Well, if I want to understand or I want to analyze, then I need to ask myself questions as I'm reading the prompt, such as, what form of writing does that writing prompt require? And we know on the RLA test it's going to require that I do argumentative writing. What's the purpose of the task? I'm going to have to persuade you to feel that side that I have taken and that the evidence of that side is the best. What information do I need to complete the task? I'm going to need to set a claim, support it with evidence and connections, the details, what kinds of points are going to make good paragraphs. So I know I need to have paragraphs that set the claim. I know I need paragraphs that support that claim with evidence. And I also know that I need to have a place for that counterclaim. Who's the audience? Well, here my audience is going to be GED testing service, but oftentimes my audience may end up being my teacher or someone else. And then, how does the audience's expectations affect my writing style? I need to have a formal style. One of the easiest routes to go is to do a short routine called unpacking the prompt. And unpacking the prompt is simply identifying the verbs and what the verbs tell students to do. So if this is my prompt, again, I'm going to show students how to set up 
just a real easy T chart and have them determine the verb, the first verb being analyze. Analyze what? The arguments. Then I need to develop. Develop what? An argument. Next I need to explain. Explain what? How one position is better supported than the other. Next I need to incorporate. Incorporate what? Evidence from both sources. So that's unpacking the claim. Or the prompt, so, sorry, but there's right. more too. <laughs> so if I were so basically what I could do is one lesson that I could do within the classroom at this point is that I could have several different prompts and you know I could even write some of my own, setting them up in the same way. And I would really spend some time first modeling what you just did with the students. And then from there, I would actually come back and have them go through and, and do that and kind of do that gradual release model so they're practicing, guided practice, and then they're working on their own. And I think, you know, since the, the prompts are, are all the same, the, the layout is the same, if we can help our students there, then we can start moving on into the next piece of it. So. As we're looking at this, you know, Bonnie, you're the one who found this quote and I think it's perfect because it really is about if we're going to teach argumentative writing or constructed response, then we've got to know that we're looking at the data, at what that is saying, what's the evidence is there. And that would be true, Bonnie, whether you were doing a sci writing in science or you're writing RLA, that you've got to know what the evidence is before you can decide that there's a thesis statement rather than starting out by teaching a thesis statement instead. So how can we do this? And I think, you know, there's a way that we have to, within the classroom, really talk with people about the process and model it through. So the question has been, basically, will the highway and transit bill be beneficial? And so at this point, I would actually have my students to go through and read two stimulus items. And I might want to break it into two pieces so that one day I do one and one day the next because I want to make sure students truly understand all this. But what we're going to do is we're going to do this thing that's called interacting with text. And we've got to make sure that our students do that. They interact with the prompt, but they also are interacting with the text itself. And we've got to keep in mind our goal for students. If we want our students to be able to write effectively, they're going to have to cite evidence. So as we start this process, then we're going to need to show them how to do that. So, Bonnie, we've got two pieces here. So shall we take on one of them? Let's just do one, yes. Okay. So I'm going to go just one step further before we come back and look at this because I want to do a little mindset for everyone who's out there. And that mindset is that really if we're going to interact with text, we really need to analyze because that's what we're doing. We've got to ask some questions as we're moving through. So on this particular slide, you'll see there's a number of different questions that pose purpose and the author, the audience, the proof, and the organization. So now having said that, I'm going to pull back to the previous slide. And shall we walk through this one a little bit? Let's do this because the reason we're taking this step by step is many of our students continue to summarize instead of analyze. So what we want them to do is to be able to look at this text, and I'm going to look at the first one, the press release. We want students to be able to ask themselves, what's this text about and what type is it? Well, students should be able to very quickly see it's a press release from a representative who should be qualified to write about a bill that has been passed. The audience are those of us who live in the community. And I see that this re representative has numerous pieces of evidence to try and persuade the reader.
that this bill should be passed, the road should be built. I also notice as I take a quick look at this that it's a very formal style and quite honestly even the sentences are extremely lengthy. So I've done a very quick analysis of this text. But Susan, there's more. I also want to teach my students how to interact with the text by identifying evidence. So where is some evidence here? Okay, if I look at this first paragraph, it says, um, and she, I mean, Representative Walls, she says this is going to be an economic boost, and, but she says, first thing, the bill will ease traffic congestion and create jobs. So that's one piece of evidence. And if I look down into the next one, uh, oh, well, she's been meeting with town hall with people at town halls who've been concerned about unemployment. So, if there's job opportunities, then that's another piece. And there's jobs, local construction workers. Oh, here's a good one. They anticipate a 30% increase in highway traffic, and that we might even have that increase might even bring in more motels and restaurant chains. Mm. As I continue on down, there's even a study here, Bonnie. It says a 2001 study in Texas showed that bypasses reduced traffic through towns by as much as 75%. Oh, that's a good one because, you know, having those facts and those stats to break something, you know, to really back something up. Okay, so I have some evidence now. That is all a part of that interacting with text and close reading, but there's one other issue that we're seeing repeatedly, and that's the aspect that students don't know what evidence really is. Susan, you just said it was facts and stacks, but is there more to evidence than that? Well, actually, we do have a lot more than that, and I think what we have to do is, for our students, they kind of got this idea that facts and stats are the, that's the primary types of evidence. And, oh, if you're in a debate club, that's probably a really good one. But there are other things that we use as evidence within the writing that we find here on the GD test. You might have examples. There's stories or there's an anecdote or there's some kind of experience that's related that would be a form of evidence. Um, there could be expert testimony. Maybe there's someone there who has been dealing with the economics of building these big bypasses. So that might be an expert testimony. Or that study could be another one that has some uh, experts behind it. Sometimes it really is about just logical reasoning. You know, there are things that just, I know that if you're going to build a road, you're going to have construction jobs. It just, it's just a fact. Or maybe I'm really getting down to that emotional appeal where, you know, I'm pulling at, look, that this gives an opportunity for this town to move ahead. Those types of things. So there really are a number of different types of evidence. And our students need to see that we've got to go beyond factual and statistical. So, Bonnie, I think you went through and we really did take a look at different types of evidence just from these source texts that we just went through. And one of the reasons is this is one of those lessons that you'll want to do in your class separately to get students used to the fact that there are different types of evidence. It's definitely not something that I would use in the process every time I teach constructed response, but it was really easy to see evidence in that representative's press release because as Susan said, we've got studies. She held town meetings. 30% increase in highway traffic, according to an official. Even some logical reasoning. You just know that if you've got more travelers, um, there's going to be motel chains, restaurant chains that are going to come in. But when you read the other document, the letter to the editor, there was not a whole lot of facts and stats there. So students may say to themselves, you know what, there's no evidence in this one, so it's definitely the less 
um, positive one to write about. And yet if students understand there is evidence other than facts and stats, such as examples or anecdotes if this project were paid for with state money alone, angry voters would have struck it down, the 2001 study shows, and even that emotional appeal, please consider local concerns. So first of all, make sure they do identify, interact with text by identifying evidence, but also do a separate lesson where they realize there are other types of evidence. So, we've gone from going ahead and analyzing the prompt, identifying the evidence, but you know, Susan, I need to figure out which side I think is better supported and to truly write an effective claim. So, what's one, one routine I could use well, to teach my students? Basically, what you're saying is that you've, you've done the analysis. You've, you've taken the whole thing apart. Let's remember what analysis is. That's but true. now that you've broken it down into all those pieces, you're going to have to judge one against the other to see where the evidence is strongest. But the big issue, though, is not just that, okay, this side won me over, but it's about why is that one side better supported than the other. And I think that's the issue that we're having with a lot of students is that understanding of you can't just go through and pick one point, but you got to look at the why behind it. What made it stronger? So, we have a, a graphic organizer here, both sides now. And the thing, Bonnie, that I like about this as far as students go is that we actually could do this. One day we read all the things for the pro side, so the press release, and identify the different pieces of evidence that are there. And we work through it all together. Now, the next day, because remember, I know in the classroom we're having to do lots of things, not just work on writing, but we could actually on the next day do evidence that opposes. And now as we come into this at the end, we're looking at it going, okay, I have listed all the evidence on both sides. Now I've got to decide which is stronger. And so now I'm going to have to evaluate on this particular one, Bonnie, you know, it seems to me that looking at the evidence that supports really has more substance behind it. It's more facts. It has the stats in there. I mean, it really does have some strong evidence. So, you know, it appears to me that the evidence that's, that is the side that supports that. But what do you think? Well, you may say that, but... I really think the side of the local person is better supported because that letter to the editor really talks about what it's going to be like if that road goes through from someone who lives there. I mean, what does that representative know? She lives a long way away, and we all know that although construction jobs are there, what's going to happen to that town when that bypass goes through and no longer will any of that traffic come downtown? I mean, that letter sure uh, really strongly shows those things. It also talks about how the representative did not listen to local concerns. So I really think that letter to the editor is the strong argument because that writer's a resident and much more credible than a representative in my humble opinion. Okay, so having said that and we have our difference of opinion here, okay, as far as the why for me, it really came down to facts. And so my decision was that in looking at those two positions, Representative Walls had the better supported position because it provided more factual and valid evidence instead of opinions. So that's my case. I'm sticking to it. But it sounds like with your case, you're going a different direction. 
Well, definitely, because there's always two sides to the argument. So my decision was when looking at both arguments, the writer of the letter to the editor has the better supported argument. And my reason why? is that letter provides that stronger argument because the writer's a resident, more credible, and uses more factual evidence. So I can support my claim with evidence that talks about credible, local types of evidence, but with some facts thrown in. You know, wouldn't okay. it be wonderful if our students could write both sides because if they could start to see that a claim can be made for both sides not only would their writing be stronger but they would immediately have a counterclaim that they could incorporate into their essay. Well, and I think the thing that we can do is with something like this or with other passages that we have, which we have different sample passages, we can do that very thing. Um, we can have both sides argued and we can start out with rather than them writing they can start out just by making the case verbally but again it is about all the steps that it took to reach this point which is really to make that claim and that's what our students need to do because if they can do that now the other pieces begin to fall into place. And if I've used my both sides now, then I can actually go back in and I can keep looking back. So I've written my claim, now I'm kind of organizing all my thoughts. I want to put identify which evidence I want to use. It's all laid out for me. So it's nice and easy for me to do that. Plus I know I've got to use something from the other side because it said I had to use t evidence from both different both of the responses there so I can do that because all that information is there from the analysis that I've done so you know that's really true Susan because it seems like we've taken a lot of time though to do both sides now but when we can see how that one routine, that one graphic organizer can really set up a strong extended response, it's an amazing thing because um, I really won't need a whole lot more in order then to go ahead and start crafting my writing sample. Absolutely. And, you know, the bottom line is that I can take either side because it's all about how I, as the writer, use the evidence to support whatever my claim is. So I think that that brings us to where we're going to look at what we're going to be doing in June. Because all this work today really has been about the thinking process required to get students into that planning mode, which is one that most of them just want to start writing as opposed to really doing the planning, the analysis that they need to do in order to have, to really earn a good score. And so I think we can go from there and in our June webinar, we're going to look about how you take that first part, the work we've already done, and let's build it out into the rest of those pieces. So what do you think about that, Bonnie? I think that that works real well because, as we've said repeatedly, it is the aspect that students just want to write. Okay, I have this, I have this, I have this. Let me just write those segments. But then what happens is they end up writing summaries. And those summaries get, it, get them really nothing but basically a zero, a scorable zero in at least parts one and two, traits one and two. And so we want to take them that next step of analyzing and evaluating evaluating and that takes time it really takes time so what we'll do is in the meantime I think there's some things that you those of you who are in our audience today can be doing with your students until we have our next webinar and that's to start this process start out by having students do some unpacking of prompts and working with that thinking, thinking through, and you leading, you modeling how to do that. And then the next one is actually to take some text and have them read those sources and find evidence. 
It doesn't have to necessarily be one that you find from the GD testing service because there are a number of different ways that are out there, for, there are different sites that you can go to. But again, it's about getting students, Bonnie said it earlier, into the habit the habit of looking at that claim that's made by and whatever the article might be and then from there having the evidence that supports that. So you have samples that are available on the GD Testing Service website but there's always Newzella and there's ProCon and Bonnie that kind of leads to a quote by Desmond Tutu. We hadn't even noticed this quote till we were reviewing it earlier today, but it's so perfect. My father used to say, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. And as I read that, there have been a couple questions on, is there a, a clearly more supported argument? And no, there's not. The interesting thing as we teach students constructive response is to remember there's always two sides to an argument. So they can take, quote, either side, and as long as they're doing what the prompt tells them to do, that they have analyzed and evaluated and they have provided those multiple pieces of evidence, one side will not get them a better score than the other. And that's really important for us to know as we start teaching this process in the classroom, which is why Susan and I keep saying if they can get through a graphic organizer, a routine such as both sides now, then the rest of the process is relatively easy. It really is. So these okay. resources are great. Okay, and then here's something that, just to, so that we can clarify, because we have had a couple of things pop up from some people. Um, you referenced a minute ago about with summaries that they would just get a scorable zero. You're not saying a summary gets a scorable zero across the board, but trait one. Is that right? Trait one. Trait one because right. they're okay. supposed to be setting a claim and supporting it with evidence. That requires analyzation and evaluation. Okay. So that we wanted to make sure yeah. that people understood is that, yes, that scoreable zero and what students are often doing is they are summarizing. So when it when it's scored for trait one, then it really doesn't have a claim and it doesn't have that evidence. So that's a real important point as we go through and talk about this. Um, the other thing, and we do have one other question that says, well, what's the meaning of a scorable zero? And I think for people who are out there that uh, you may want to take a look at some of the resources available on the GD Testing Service website, but a scorable zero just means that a student really didn't do on trait one a sufficient amount to earn a one or a two. They put something to paper, but they didn't have enough to earn a point or two points off of it. So if you take a look at those, um, the resource guides and the scoring rubric um, for uh, the GED testing service for the science as well as for the social uh, for the uh, reasoning through language arts. I think you can see more about that. Um, one other thing is, Bonnie, a question came through because you and I are talking about you would take one side, I would take the other side. So the question here is: so there's really not a clearly more supported argument? No, <laughs> that's okay. what we were talking about Where? earlier. No, clear there is no. <laughs> it really isn't a more clearly uh, supported argument. It really does come down to how the student responds to that argument. So, instead, there's one. I was going to say there's one more. Let's just cover before we go on, and it talks about emotional appeals are not always a strength, and you're right. Emotional appeals, though, are a type of evidence that can be used by students to either be a positive or a strength or not. Um, so yes, I could definitely, if I took Susan's side on the representative side was stronger, I could definitely say that the other side used very few facts but rather more emotional appeals. However, I could use it the other way and say because this, you know, this person is local and understands what his or her community goes through, 
it could be used as a positive piece of evidence. Now, we all know that if we're doing research, writing, etc., emotional appeals are the lesser type of evidence, but we're not quite there with these students. We're just thrilled when they provide multiple pieces. So really, really good um, questions there. Absolutely. And let's just do, before we go to the full question and the answer period, um, just a couple of test taking tips. Um, as we did today, make sure that you work with students on reading and unpacking that prompt. That's where every, all of the directions for what they're supposed to do is embedded in that prompt. So that's a very important thing. The next is that we really do help our students learn how to engage with the text or closely read. You can use either term so that they're analyzing and then evaluating that evidence. Don't forget, there is a highlighting tool that's included on the GED test itself, so they can highlight text um, within, you know, within, they can highlight items within the source text. They have the erasable note boards, so they could do a T-chart and they could actually put you know, evidence from the pro side and the con side and, and have it right in front of them as a, a helping tool. The other thing is that our students really need to think about how they use their time. You know, they got 45 minutes and they should be spending 10 to 15 of those really reading and planning that upfront work because that allows the rest to come through. And then they also need a little bit of time at the end to go back and just do a quick proofread. We often see in some of these responses, like the, the one that we looked at, the misspelling of restaurant. Those kinds of things could actually be picked up and it could be corrected um, if the student just knows how to manage that time. So you have one other item that we have and that is the resources. And Bonnie, if you want to talk a little bit about the resources, I will go pull them up. I sure will. And for those of you who are asking about some different resources for the writing process, um, we are going to include more in June on things such as opening and closing paragraphs, etc. On this one, what you have in your resource guide is, and Susan's going to get up there in just a moment, PDFs I'm are not sorry, always quick. I apologize for making everybody busy. <laughs> okay. um, what, you, what you have here is the stimulus material, the source text, as well as the extended response that we reviewed. We also gave you the annotations of why that response earned a perfect score. And that's really important for us and our students to know as well as how to earn points. You have some answer guidelines and then you have some information on making thinking processes visible. I think when you look at some of that you're going to say, oh, I do that. And we definitely do. You also have some graphic organizers for unpacking the prompt and you have the both sides now as well as the types of evidence. When you look at the types of evidence, you'll see a different passage that we've used and the types of evidence from that passage. And then you also have some RLA resources from the World Wide Web that take you through how to write constructed responses, resources for source text, all kinds of things, and they're free. Next time what you will get are graphic organizers and routines for each part of the process, starting with um, a very quick review of unpacking the prompts, but more importantly, some organizers and routines for actually writing or drafting the text. So all of these things are available to you to download. We've had a couple questions on the PowerPoint whether that will also be available for printing and Yes, it is. If there are slides that you you know you want a large copy, you do have emails. Um, we will be glad to send them to you. You have both Susan's and my email on this particular workbook guide. We'll also show you that you have GDTS's communication. Um, email. But again, I know a few of you would like to have larger slides of some of those. Please feel free to email Susan on me or me on that. So, 
Susan, are we ready for some questions? Ah, uh, yes, I think we are. And I was just looking through, and there's one here.